Hi everyone, I'm Marina Mazi. And I'm Fadi Bors Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the 40th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. And what's very clear is that the revolution was not Islamic, it was expropriated and suppressed by the Islamic movement. And the effects of that revolution remain today and is one of the challenges that the regime faces. And this week's interview is with Jenny Van Hammer from uh, Femen Sweden. Stay with us. It's the 40th anniversary of the so-called Islamic Revolution and the Iranian regime is celebrating it pathetically, to be honest. And what's uh, the reality is that it's called an Islamic Revolution because history is written by the victor. But what's very clear is that the revolution was never an Islamic Revolution. If it was Islamic, then it would have had the characteristics and demands of the Islamist movement, the demands of the Iranian revolution in 79 was not we want decapitations and Sharia court and stonings and veil and segregation. and segregation and so on and so forth. They were demands against the Shah's dictatorship for freedom and for equality. And so what's very clear is that the revolution was never Islamic. It was suppressed by the Islamic movement. And in fact, an entire generation was slaughtered in Iran for this regime to be able to stabilize itself. Just recently, one of the mothers of Khavaran, Mother Lotfi, who uh, was one of the leaders of this campaign of mothers demanding accountability for their children who had been executed by the Iranian regime. She recently passed away. And again, that's just one example of the horrors of this regime. Absolutely. And the continuation of that resistance against the Islam is from day one up to today. And today's movement against the Islamic regime is very much continuation of that radicalism of uh, 1979 um, revolution. And I think when you look at the history of the establishment of the Islamic regime, the Islamic regime was established after suppressing the uh, 1979 revolution. Uh, remember Women's March in International Women's Day in Tehran uh, in, uh, in the 80, 1980. Remember the um, struggle in Kurdistan. Remember the Caspian Sea uh, region and Turkmen Sahara. Uh, people trying to sort of establish uh, um, local sort of uh, um, um, people intervention in in running of uh, um, the society. Uh, remember the fight for free press uh, in Iran, and remember the slaughter of the whole you know a whole generation of Iranian intellectuals, radicals, and uh, social activists. This narrative that the revolution in Iran was Islamist, was the Islamic revolution is both uh, uh, um, advocated by the Islamic regime and the right-wing monarchist uh, and, and the right-wing sort of alternative in, um, you know, internationally you could see they are trying to uh, dissuade people and prevent people from repeating that uh, uh, experience. Yeah, and there's a lot of propaganda against revolution and the reality is that revolutions are ways in which people can actually have a say in their situation from the bottom up. Otherwise, it's very often, you know, uh, in positions from above, whether it's coup d'etats, whether it's regime change from above, whether it's the alternative that Trump and Bolton have for Iran, uh, you know, or the um, so-called the Pahlavi, the monarchy, uh, you know, the monarchists have now for Iran. It's It's always from above, in a sense. And revolutions are not violent. It's the violence that is used to suppress them. Uh, it, it's actually one of the best ways in which people can intervene in the society and change it for the better. And also, when you actually look at both, uh, uh, any revolution, people have dry, tried to reform. People have tried to change from within. But the, all the roots are closed. When you look at the uh, 1970s in Iran, it was a completely closed society. Nobody was uh, allowed to participate uh, into running of the uh, society, except a very small minority linked to the uh, Shah and the monarchists. And look at the Islamic regime today. People have tried to make changes as possible, but all the doors are closed. That's why people, the only means of fundamentally changing society for the benefit of the population, revolution remains the only solution. I mean, that's what, where we are. And if people have the right to change the current situation uh, in Iran and remove the Islamic regime and change the Islamic system, if people in uh, Syria had the right to uh, uh, 
you know, uh, revolt against the Assad regime. And uh, for the same reason, people in 1979 in Iran had the right to um, uh, to revolt against the uh, uh, monarchist regime and try to change it. Unfortunately, not all the time the outcome and results are what people desire initially, and sometimes you get defeated. But that doesn't take away the essence of the radical demand for a better society. To, I mean, look at the today's uh, demand in Iran. Non-religious, people want a society where religion doesn't role, play a role at all. Or they want a secular uh, system. They, want, they don't want a justice system which is based on revenge. Rather, they want a system which is based on uh, looking at the problem, uh, trying to resolve the issue, and trying to reconstruct uh, uh, the society so it doesn't get repeated. These are the sort of things that uh, people in Iran want, and they have the right uh, to establish that order. Mm. And one of the things, too, is this whole thing of, uh, you know, Trump uh, intervening in Iran and people wanting, some segments of society wanting U.S. intervention. I mean, we need to look at the facts. Where has U.S. government intervened that has been beneficial to the population at large? Iraq, has it improved? Afghanistan, Latin American countries? Um, and also, if you look at the history of Iran itself, U.S. intervention has always been negative, whether it's the imposition of a puppet regime, the Shah's regime, whether it's involvement in a coup d'etat in 1953, and even the Islamic regime was the result of U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War. The uh, their policy was to create a green belt around the Soviet Union at the time. So, in fact, they met at Guadeloupe at a conference and decided that they preferred an Islamic alternative. So, so looking to Trump or looking to reform in the Iranian regime or looking to, you know, reactionary political forces rather than people's actual movement, which is really the, the real hope in Iran, um, it, it's self-defeating and it's, it's, it's really helping uh, those forces trying to, you know, put things together behind scenes or from above rather than and relying on absolutely. people. Absolutely. I mean, the, the result, uh, look at what John Bolton is trying to sort of uh, um, organize Mujahideen, the most, you know, uh, sectarian religious sect that you could have, rent them off, that's what they are or to trying to support the right being sort of monarchist uh, uh, um, in Iran. Um, that's, not, that's not a solution for Iran or Middle East. I mean, they, they are, uh, everybody's getting uh, together in Warsaw trying to sort of, you know, come up with a plan. The reality is that uh, the narrative that we want to give and the narrative of the Iranian people, we want a society which is free from religion. We want a society that just the system is based on uh, um, reconstruction of society rather than revenge and that's uh, that's why the, it's important to give a decent narrative of a 1979 the true history of 1979 mm. must be written not by Trump not by Mujahideen not by the Islamic regime it will be written by the next revolution in Iran which is demanding a human society yeah I mean just to reiterate what you were saying we have huge social political movements in Iran, whether it's labor, labor rights movement, women's movement, youth movement against the death penalty for children's rights, for animal rights, for environmental, for the environment, all of these are based fundamentally on human, secular, modern values, and and really that is uh, the hope of Iran. Those social and political movements, those civil society activists and organizations working for a different and a better world. And that's the, the future hope of Iran. Jenny, what a pleasure to have you here with us today. I wanted to ask about you. You're a feminine activist. Uh, but tell me about the first sort of topless act you did. I think it was in defense of Amina. Why did you feel like you, you needed to come out topless and do that? Yes. I had started Feminine Sweden on Facebook already in the beginning of 2012. Mm -hmm. And I was completely in the closet, not showing anybody uh, that it was me. 
sharing pictures from feminine and news from feminine and feminism in the world. And like in the end of 2012, I posted a photo uh, with me because I was so fed up with Facebook uh, blocking me and erasing me because of their problem with the uh, women nipples. Mm. So I made a photo and it was really impossible to recognize me. I kind of covered all my face in Photoshop and changed things so nobody would possibly recognize me because I thought it was such a big thing. And then just some month later, Amina started Femen in Tunisia and she was kidnapped and, and just disappeared. And I was so upset that the next morning when I woke up, I was like, it's, it's now. Mm -hmm. So I had my first photo made and it immediately became big, like 10,000 people just shared it immediately and magazines started contacting me. And then the thing with uh, Amina grew and you with other Iranians and Iranians in Sweden like Farid Arman mm -hmm. and, um, and more Iranians in Sweden and also from some other countries from the Middle East. Uh, together with Femen, uh, and you were speaking with Ina Chevchenko, started the Topless Jihad. Mm -hmm. So my first time ever topless publicly in a like a public place because I grew up in a time when in Sweden it was very normal to be topless on the beach. It's not so much today, but when I grew up it was it was like almost embarrassing to not be topless at some point. Um, but like this in a public space inside the city, it was definitely the first time and it was the first time for Farida too. And, uh, and this was uh, 4th of April 2013 that we started the Topless Jihad campaign and people were sending photos from all over Europe and the world in support doing the same. So that was, that was my first time. And I mean... How did it feel being a feminine activist, I mean, uh, being topless? Because as you said, it wasn't something that happened in the public space. And uh, I think it is quite uncomfortable for a lot of people when they first do it. Yes, yes, like, like I tried to describe with my first photo, it was really a big thing. And at that time I had already had two children and I was like older and I had a... It was difficult. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when I was taking sun in the garden, I was always like having clothes close and if there was some hole somewhere I was checking, you know, it was a big thing. And I feel that it's really, really empowering part of Femen that today I have absolutely zero problem to just be topless wherever, whenever, in a second. Mm -hmm. So I feel really absolutely no problem with... Um, with that sexism and objectification and also all the criticism especially of women bodies mm -hmm. and what was kind of the tipping point for that was that there was this same photo of me and uh, well, I'm old enough to not know how old I was at that time mm -hmm. but um, I don't know maybe I was like 40 I don't know mm -hmm. and um, no it can't be I was more than 40 um, so this photo of me from the Feminine Actions was out and the typical thing when you want to attack a woman mm -hmm. is to attack her body and how she looks. You know that that's how you can you know, get to her. So of course all the racists, all the right wings, all the ones that were uh, against me, um, where it's especially a lot of male trolls, they were all saying that my breasts were ugly that they were too old, I was too old, my breasts were too soggy, this was, this was like a lot of those comments. But, in the same time, the same photo was used by a journalist in a big, uh, in a big um, newspaper where she was writing that uh, I and Femen could not be taken serious because I was too young and too beautiful <laughs> and my breasts were too perfect <laughs> and it was the same picture. So I really realized that this has nothing to do with me and how I look or anything. This has only got to do with their master suppression techniques and knowing that it's on a woman you always go on, on her looks. There's a couple of uh, trials you've been taken to. You've been taken to court for some of your actions. Yes. Uh, and some of them were quite dangerous as well, weren't they? Uh, tell us about, well, one of them... Um, uh, I think you've been fined on a number of occasions um, uh, at the mosque 
Yes, uh, we made um, Ali El Mari led an action in the Stockholm Mosque in uh, in the weekend that it was the big uh, one year protest of against Mursi. He had been in power for one year. I think it was like 70 million people in the streets in in Egypt out protesting. And Alia has asylum here since she was part of the Arabian Spring and was one of the bloggers and, and went out topless. And she also made the first feminine photo ever in Sweden in, uh, in 2012, also against uh, Sharia and, and theocracy. And um, she wanted to make something, so she chose, uh, like the capital, Stockholm, she chose the biggest mosque and it's a mosque that has connections with the Muslim Brotherhood, as does Mursi. Uh, of course, it was very controversial in Sweden because this, yeah, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, but and she led it, and then it was also uh, Maryam from from Tunisia who lives in France, and then it was me, and it was my first big action. And uh, so it was a Friday morning, and we got in. And it was, I think it was like 10 men there. And they immediately scared away all the journalists and photographers that had come there to, to, to document the action. So we were left alone inside uh, without any journalist or without any photographer. And they are very much our security when we do a, a feminine action because they can document what's, what's happening and people know that it's being documented so they keep calm. So it was really tense, but we stayed there and, and all the way until the police came, like 20, 30 minutes later. And it was going front and back, because some of them were very calm and like not doing anything bad. And some were aggressive and wanted to attack us, and the calm ones calmed them down. It was moving front and back. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they said we were um, a bad fucked horse from hell. And then an interesting thing was that when the police came, they said that I was the leader. Mm -hmm. Because they have this strange kind of racism, thinking that it had to be me that was the blonde Swede that was the leader, and not the most small and most quiet, mm -hmm. very peaceful Ali Al Mari. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you were fined for that, yes. as well as for... Um, for uh, we made, shortly after, we made action um, this was in the time that Putin installed the so-called anti-gay law in mm -hmm. Russia, mm -hmm. together with Kirill, and um, and uh, right in in this summer it started to appear videos where uh, homophobes in Russia tricked homosexual guys to come to meetings, and then they tortured them and filmed it, and and um, it was out on the net. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, first, the day before, we made an action together with the uh, Iranians uh, in Stockholm, the ex-Muslims, um, against, the, um, against the regime in Iran, of course, but also in support of the, um, the LGBTQ community that escape as refugees to Sweden and, and need um, asylum and is not getting enough support from here. So, so that was the first, and yeah, I just want to say, like, it's been all the way since my first action in Sweden, always been the Iranians who, who's been supporting us the most and really understood what we're doing and what is the danger and why are we doing this. So first we made this demonstration with them, topless, in Stockholm during Pride. And then the next day, me and Alia climbed this three meter fence and got in the Russian embassy. And I was afraid before because uh, I know that when you get when I got in, when we got in, we were not on Swedish territory anymore. So it was Russian laws, and I was also told like this is the embassy in Sweden that has more weapon than any other embassy. And I was, I mean, I was thinking that this can be my last day. They can shoot me if they want. So uh, nothing happened, but it was scary. I left my daughter in in the in the morning and like said goodbye and I was afraid. Um, so this this I was also fined for and uh, it was beautifully paid, the fines, 
by Elizabeth Olsson Wallin that is like our super duper uh, activist photographer in Sweden that I really like a lot mm -hmm. and um, she's been doing a lot of exhibitions for, for gay rights and, and uh, when we were in the trial of the Russian embassy I used, I used the trials as a way to again tell our message so I think it's good to go to trials because then we get a second chance after the action and after after the news and after the articles uh, so it's a lot of job after an action to follow up with all the news and then in the trial you get one more chance to tell your message so that was good and uh, immediately after we just went straight out and got ready to go do an action and a photo in the Catholic Church because and the day after there would be huge demonstrations in Madrid because it was when the Spanish uh, more and more fascist government uh, was uh, trying to cut on the abortion rights mm -hmm. and this is all in connection with the Catholic Church and, uh, and the Vatican. So we wanted to make a, a support photo in the Catholic Church and it was not really supposed to be an action, we just wanted to do the photo in the church. But it became an action because they got so violent and so angry uh, and tried to put plastic bags over our head and dragged our hair and and uh, Elizabeth was there and she got some photos when the, the priest was holding my mouth and also uh, like strangling me and it got really powerful photos and it was all over the news on, on, on the first page the next day so she got paid for this photo and it exactly covered the fines for the for the <laughs> oh, Russian embassy. Yeah. So that was beautiful. So why why do you keep doing it when it can be quite risky? And I mean, you you know, you're talking about not knowing if you're going to get home that evening. Why would you carry on doing it? I cannot think of the world uh, that I will leave to my children, especially to my daughter, um, if things get worse and I've already seen that it's got worse because Sweden was a lot different when I grew up so I don't know I guess I could write a, a book about that and I don't really have the answer because that would have to explain who I am as a person and everything and I can't really I can't fully explain why I do this but I just know that I cannot not, not do it <laughs> yeah and how do you think topless activism fits in to general activism? I mean, I mean, because you know there are lots of criticism about why mm. would you use your body? Because it's, but your body is already being used for profit and this and that. Why mm. would you use it in protest? Well, for me, I I was not only a politician. I was an artist, and I had worked for a long time already with um, uh, with. Um, paintings with the female body and it had been more about my own process of you know of relations and also of me as a woman in society so I had already been painting this kind of paintings uh, like without clothes uh, but without being um, about being looking beautiful more like the message of the body and uh, this was one of the things that I liked so much when I found Femin. I started Femin Sweden on Facebook like in 15 minutes after I read about them the first time. Because I liked, I liked this way of uh, using, um, of not seeing the woman's body and not seeing, if you see it as sexual or not, I mean that's up to me. Uh, if, if I'm feeling sexual or not, it, I don't really care if you think I'm sexy or not, it's not relevant to me. But if I feel sexy even that way, I still have the right to, to be sexy without anybody raping me or thinking that, uh, that they have any right to, to abuse me. So this was of course something that I liked when I saw Femen using it as an empowerment tool instead of something that we should hide and, and adopt. Because I think it's very sexist when, when somebody say, um, why are you showing your breasts? I'm like, why are you saying that I'm showing my breasts? I'm not showing my breasts, I'm just not covering myself. Uh, because they don't say that about a man. They don't tell a man, why are you showing your tits? Uh, 
Mm. It's, it's, it's even in the word use, you see that there is a sexist way of looking at a woman. So I think immediately in that attitude, you discover that the person asking this question is shaped by sexism, and I should not adapt to that sexism. I should not let my life being run or ruled by by somebody's your sexist uh, skewed uh, worldview. Yeah. And finally, I mean, uh, you're doing uh, you you are an artist, so you're doing portraits. Uh, you're doing uh, uh, you've done quite a few paintings already of feminine goddesses. Why are you doing that? What's what's the message behind that? I was already doing body prints before, and these paintings are also made with body prints. And before I didn't make them with the real person, it was just a body print and then I invented a person to tell the story I wanted to tell. But now I'm doing portraits, so I am gathering these body prints from the most radical activists, in feminist activists in the world, that is Femen, I, you cannot find more radical feminist activists in the world. And uh, I gather these body prints and then I, I make the portrait on their print. And um, I want to, to honor these women and activists that have shaped my life. All my life has completely changed since then, since, then, since I started with Femen. And I know I can die just, you know, anytime. So this is something I want to do before I die. I want to honor Femen. And the name Femen Goddesses is because we always, we always love to, to fight for blasphemy. And we have so many actions since Josephine went in the Kölner Dome Dome in Christmas and just jumped up and had this text of I am God standing up there behind a priest. So we have this I am God. So I think feminine goddesses is both honoring us and in the same time mocking this thing of patriarchy thinking that they have a monopoly on who is God and the monotheism and, and all this. So. I think the name is good. And what is interesting for me, I have discovered that my first paintings with body prints were kind of small, so it didn't really fit a face and it was not so important because my message was about the body. But later they got bigger and they started having a face. And I just realized even later that the timing of my painting starting to have a face and a head was the same time as I got in feminine. And now, to make the, the feminine goddesses portraits, they are even bigger because feminine activists are taking <laughs> more space because we also use the arms and the body. And I have realized like I would even need to do them like two by two meters because we also use you know, the legs and the feet. So the whole process for me, when I look at how my paintings have been developing, it's been about taking space. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators 
It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.